welcome uh, to Wednesday night, and I trust that uh, you've had a good week so far, and there, there is more to come. Let's start tonight here on page number 12, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. Let's stand, we're going to sing this song, and then a new song, maybe to some of us, worthy of worship, worthy of praise. Let's lift it up. All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall. Bring forth a royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth a royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Ye chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransomed from the fall. To him who saves you by his grace, and crown him the Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace, and crown him Lord of all. Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball to Him all majesty ascribe and crown Him Lord of all. To Him all majesty ascribe and crown Him Lord of all. On the last Oh, that with yonder sacred throng we at His feet may fall. We'll join the everlasting song and crown Him Lord of all. We'll join the everlasting song and crown Him Lord of all. Well, that's going to be a good day, amen, when we crown Him Lord of all. Let's sing this next one, worthy of worship, <clears throat> worthy of praise, worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all the glad songs we can sing, and worthy of all of the offerings we bring. What an incredible song for us tonight. Here we go. Worthy of worship, worthy of praise, worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all the glad songs we can sing, and worthy of all of the offerings we bring. You are worthy, Father, Creator. You are worthy, Savior, Sustainer. You are worthy, worthy and wonderful, worthy of worship and praise. Worthy of reverence and worthy of fear, worthy of love and devotion, worthy of bowing and bending the knee, worthy of all this and added to these. You are worthy, Father, Creator. You are worthy, Savior, Sustainer. You are worthy, worthy and wonderful, worthy of worship and praise. On the last... <clears throat> Almighty Father, our Master and Lord, King of all kings and Redeemer, Wonderful Counselor, Comforter, Friend, 
Savior and source of our life without end. You are worthy, O Father, Creator. You are worthy, Savior, Sustainer. You are worthy, worthy and wonderful, worthy of worship and praise. Ron, would you open us up in a word of prayer tonight? Amen. Please be seated. Please be seated. Our teens, you guys are dismissed at this time. Go ahead out. It's good to see each and every one of you tonight. If you guys are doing well. Take your Bibles again to uh, Malachi chapter number 2 this week. Malachi chapter number 2. And uh, here we are walking through a, a different series on uh, Wednesdays <clears throat> called The Lies That Blind. The Lies that blind. And as you know, Malachi is the last um, prophet, a minor prophet, not minor in his message, but um, all the minor prophets are designated as such just because their books are short, that's all. Um, but we have an incredible message. Actually, Malachi's name means messenger, and other times it's translated in the Hebrew, uh, the angel of the Lord. So when, uh, when Christ would show up, it would be the Malachi of the Lord. Of, um, so, and so his, his name means uh, message or messenger. And God certainly has a message uh, for his people uh, in this time in Malachi chapter number two. And I want to <clears throat> read uh, this chapter and uh, we'll walk through each seven, all 17 of the verses tonight and uh, look at three more lies, three more lies that blind. All right. It says this in verse number one, and now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. If ye uh, will not hear, if ye will not lay it to heart to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already, because you do not lay it to heart. Behold, I will corrupt your seed and spread dung upon your, upon your faces, even the dung of your solemn feast, and one shall take you away with it. And ye shall know that I have sent this commandment unto you, that my commandment, excuse me, that my covenant might be with Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. My covenant was with him of life and peace, and I gave to him for the fear wherewith he feared me and was afraid before my name. The law of truth was in his mouth. And iniquity was not found in his lips. He walked with me in peace and equity and did turn away from iniquity. And the priest's lips should keep knowledge and they should seek the law at his mouth. For he is the messenger of the Lord of hosts. But ye are departed out of the way. Ye have caused many to stumble at the law, even... You have corrupted the covenant of Levi, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore, have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people according, as ye have not kept my ways and have been partial in the law. Have we not all one Father? Hath not one God created us? Why do you deal treacherously every man against his brother and profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah hath dealt treacherously. And an abomination is committed in Israel and in Jerusalem, and Judah hath profaned the holiness of the Lord, which he loved. He hath married the daughter of a strange God. The Lord will cut off the man that doeth this, the master and the scholar, out of the tabernacles of Jacob, and, out, and him that offereth an offering unto the Lord of hosts. For this hath he done again, covering the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying out insomuch, he regardeth not thy offering any more, nor receive it with the good will at your hand. Ye say, Wherefore? Because the Lord hath been a witness 
between thee and between the wife of thy youth, youth, whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. Did not he make one? Yet he hath the residue of the Spirit. And wherefore one? That he might seek a goodly seed, a godly seed. Therefore, take heed to your spirit, and let none deal treacherously against the wife of his youth. For the Lord, the God of Israel, saith that he hateth putting away. For one covereth violence with his garment, saith the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that ye deal not treacherously. Ye have not, excuse me, ye have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet ye say, wherein have we wearied him? When ye say, every one that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them. Or, when ye say, where is the God of judgment? Let's pray. Father, tonight as we open up your word, it is our heart's desire that you help us, and Lord, that the Spirit leads and directs in everything that we say, everything that we think, everything that we take away from the Word tonight. <clears throat> the truth is, Lord, there is a uh, half a week's worth of battles yet to come before we're back in your house uh, on Sunday and back hearing and fellowshipping uh, with uh, God's people and in God's Word uh, together. And I pray, God, that you would strengthen us uh, for the days to come. Turn our hearts and minds toward you, turns our, turn our desires toward you, turn our praises toward you, Lord, and Lord, may your name be lifted up among us and in this place. We pray for our town, uh, we pray for the people of this town who drive by uh, this uh, building every day, they see uh, this building every day, and Lord, I pray that uh, you would uh, put it on their hearts to to come in, help us, Lord, to be faithful witnesses of you, and, Lord, to um, be spreading the gospel. These things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, so uh, quite a bit uh, in those 17 verses, uh, but I wanted you to get the whole idea of what is being said here. And um, I want us to see our first slide here in uh, the first few verse, verses. It says, And now, uh, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. If ye will not hear... And if you will not lay it to heart to give glory unto my name, saith the Lord of hosts, all right, uh, even I will send a curse upon you. I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them. And because you do not lay it to heart. Now, uh, this is, you know, almost this, uh, um, <clears throat> this uh, ethereal aspect of, of what they're supposed to be believing, right? The, well, we, 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 most of the time we can, only, um, we can only gather from people what they believe by what they say and by what they do. But see, God doesn't, God doesn't see us like that, right? God sees, what did, he tell, what did he tell Samuel? When Eliab walked in and Eliab was the tallest, he was big and strong, and Samuel said, surely this is the Lord's anointed, uh, when he walked into Jesse's house, and uh, the Lord said, no, 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 uh, don't look at him the way that man looks at him, I don't do that. I look at the heart. So uh, we see lie number one that was coming up, this vertical lie. Uh, we're going to have a vertical lie, a horizontal lie, and then an internal lie, just a way for us to categorize uh, them, them as we go throughout the week, that God only cares about my actions, not what's on the inside. That God only cares about my actions, but not what's on the inside. Now, I know that uh, none of us good uh, church-going folks here on Wednesday night uh, would ever fall into this trap that uh, we would be uh, perfectly good church-goers and Christians and lovers of Jesus and Christ followers on the outside, but on the inside, uh, be struggling with some things and uh, be keeping some things and holding some things uh, away from the Lord that He's been after us for some time uh, to turn over to Him. Certainly there's not a, a dark, uh, uh, you know, a skeleton-filled closet in my heart or in your heart, uh, but because God only cares about the outside and not the inside. There's a story of a man uh, who one day uh, decided that he would sell his house. And it was a beautiful house, a house that he had worked on for a long time, and he had uh, a lot of equity in the house, and uh, it was something he would sell 
uh, but there was a contingency, one contingency clause in the contract of selling his house that he would uh, sell the entire house besides one nail that was over top the door, the front door of the house. And people would come by and look at the house and Oh, it's a beautiful house, and wow, you know, the price isn't that bad, but look at that, that, that one thing. Well, why is that? Well, I want to sell the whole house. I want to sell the, sell the house, everything except this one nail. Eventually, somebody bought that house. And they bought that house, and they're loving the renovations, and everything was going great and uh, going well. And uh, one day, the man showed up with uh, the carcass of a dead animal and hung it on the nail of the house. And the person woke up in the morning, comes outside, and whoa, what is that? What is that? What, what, you know, what is going on? It takes the, takes the animal down. Well, the guy comes out to him and says, hey, 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 that's my nail. Put that back. Put that back. And so hanging on this beautiful house is the carcass of this dead animal because somebody else owns just a nail of this guy's house. Let me ask you tonight. Does he have all of you? Does he have every part of you? Does he have not just your actions, but the things that you want to do? Does he have the things that you desire to do? Listen, the truth is, and we all know that, that we will all have this sin struggle, this sin nature struggle for the rest of our life, but let me ask you a question. Are we trending closer to Christ or are we trending away from Him? You know, um, a sad thing um, that has happened uh, in the world in which we live today is that so many Christians think that just saying a prayer, that, that just showing up to church, that just being part uh, of a good church is enough to get them in. And God says a whole bunch of different things about that. Matter of fact, Jesus says this, and it's kind of a cool little thing here. Matthew in chapter 23, verses 25 and 26, he's talking to a, a, a very well-known uh, group of individuals that we would know. He said, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within are full of extortion and excess. Let me ask you something. How many of you have ever, have ever gone to the cabinet and pulled a cup out of the cabinet, and uh, everything looked great, but on the inside... It was filthy. Has that ever happened to anybody? Dishwashers are great until they don't wash dishes. All right, that's just, you know, something happens. Or, or you pour yourself something, and then you take a sip, and here comes something floating up to the top. It's like, oh, man, mercy me. That's the worst. That's what Jesus says. That's that, that's that feeling inside of the heart of God when Christians say, hey, everything out here is great, but on the inside is full of, what's he say? Extortion and excess. Notice he goes on. Uh, thou blind Pharisee, well, the lies that blind, here we go. Uh, thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and the platter, and the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you're like unto whited sepulchres, which indeed appear beautiful on the outward, but within are full of dead man's bones and are of all uncleanness. Even so, ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. Church, listen. Friend, listen. It's easy. It's easy to get here. It's easy. You know, you, you know how we get there? You got a lot to do. And so you have a lot to do, and you sleep in by accident, and you get up, and you start running, and you start going, you start going, and all of a sudden, it's a day. Just a day. Ah, just a day. But then it's another day. And, another, and soon it's been a week. Soon it's been a month. Soon it's been six months before you've prayed. You're like, wow, that's drastic. No, that's real life. That's what happens. I was talking with my dad the other day. We were on our way. Uh, I was driving uh, uh, the, the truck back uh, from Omaha, and, um, and I was telling him, I said, listen, man, th it happens so fast. Here I am trying to pastor a church, and I realized, man, I haven't spent the amount of time in prayer I need to be spending in prayer. It's just so fast. 
Why? Because time stops for no one. It just keeps rolling. It just keeps going. Notice what he says here in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 5, Paul writing to this church, Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who will both bring light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest or make known the counsels of the heart, and then shall every man have praise of God. Have any of you ever seen the movie Inside Out? You ever seen the movie Inside Out? Okay, good. Some of uh, our, our seasoned saints are like, I don't know what you're talking about. And that's okay. Uh, it's a kid's movie. Uh, but uh, the whole gist of the movie is this, this young girl and her family who are moving across town, and it keeps showing uh, on the inside of her what's going on. Uh, that she has these emotions of joy and sadness and anger and fear of all these different things that are going on uh, inside of her. And it was neat to see, you know, really the world's idea of what goes on the inside when the Bible talks about it being real hundreds of years. What does it say? The counsels of the heart. On the inside, there's all these different things that are going on, all these different things that are vying for your attention, that are vying for you to do it this way. And those four characters are trying to press buttons and make this girl do these things based on this, this uh, emotion or uh, this, this idea. And God says, listen, what happens on the outside is almost not even nearly as important as what's going on inside of your heart. And that's what these guys and Malachi were missing. Sure, were they making sacrifices? Sure. Sure. Were they in the temple every day? Sure. What did it say in, ver in chapter number 1? They were offering polluted bread. They were, they were bringing God, not their best, but their leftovers. They were bringing God their worst. All of a sudden, year after year, day after day, uh, uh, simply slipping away from God, moment by moment, step by step, they had come to believe that God only cared about the actions but not the condition of their heart. The truth is that God desires, a, uh, God desires to wholly have His children, bringing Him the greatest glory and praise. Our actions alone are not the issue. God desires all of my heart. Actions alone are not the issue. God desires all of my heart. Skip down to verse number 9. We're going to look at the horizontal lie. The vertical lie between me and God. All right, this horizontal lie. I can be right with God and wrong with others. Uh, we, we might understand it a little bit easier to say this. I can be wrong with others and right with God. I can be wrong with others and right with God. Look at verse number 9. He says this, Therefore, have I also made you contemptible and base before all the people according or because of or for the reason that as you have not kept my ways but have been partial in the law. Have we not one Father and have not one God created us? Why do you deal treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of your fathers? Now, what's he saying? Well, what happens when you have a worldly people doing the Lord's work? The Lord's work gets worldly. And so when, when those people that would come in that, that had money, that had respect, that, uh, that people knew, that those people were, were beginning to get preferential treatment in God's house. And that's what he's talking about. He, he's saying, listen, uh, your heart is not right and your actions are not right. And now the way you're beginning to treat those horizontally and not right because your vertical relationship is being tainted by a lie. Your horizontal relationships are being tainted by a lie. Now I don't have this on the screen tonight, but I wish that I, wish that I had. Um, but the idea is this, that believing a lie about God and about others. All right, so that's the first ray. Believing a lie about God or about others nullifies our ability to love them to the capacity that we uh, originally intended. And believing a lie about God will nullify our ability to love Him or love them to the capacity 
that was originally intended, originally commanded, however you want to look at it. Well, what does it do? It hamstrings us. It, it, it holds us back. It's a, a sprinter with concrete shoes on. It's someone trying to find uh, someone in the dark with a blindfold without a flashlight in the middle of nowhere, having been spun around. It just completely destroys our ability to love them to the capacity that we were once intended. Look at what Jesus said again in Matthew chapter number 5. Therefore, if thou bring the gift to the altar, and rememberest that thy brother hath aught against thee, have ought against thee. Not only, not, he's not just saying, it, it's almost taking for granted the fact that if you have ought against someone, you've already taken care of it. But if someone else has ought against you, he says, I don't want your gift, leave it there, then go get it right. He said, I want this horizontal relationship between my children right before I even want your offering." Now, in many churches, that's probably bad uh, Baptist uh, doctrine there, but he said, listen, hey, hey I, want, I want you right with your brother before I want your offering. He says, leave your gift and go thy way and first be reconciled to thy brother, then come and offer thy gift. And again, in John 4, verses 20 and 21, if a man say, I love God and hates his brother, he said, he's a liar. It's impossible. It's impossible. That's why it's such a tragedy in this world today that, that among anybody who confesses the name of Christ that there should be any shred of racism in that person's heart. It's a tragedy. God hates it. He hates it. Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world. It's a little Sunday school song, but it's so true. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in His sight. Jesus loved the little children of the world. Oh, I could be right with God and wrong with others. No, you can't. Stop it. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him that he who loveth, uh, loveth God love his brother also. We talked about that this past Sunday night. We won't labor on in that. The truth is that God cares deeply about His children. Let me say this again. God cares deeply about how His children treat others, so much so that He raises that as the measuring stick of who His followers are. Let me say it again without bumbling it this time, hopefully. God cares so deeply about how His children treat one another so much so that he raises it to the measuring stick of discipleship. They'll know that you're my disciples by the love you have one for another. A third lie we'll pull out tonight and just take a look at is found in verse number 17, and it's, and it's really the most blatant of all. It's really the most audacious lie of all. And what we see happening is these lies building on top of one another, getting more erroneous, getting more outrageous as they go on. Notice the internal lie. We saw the vertical lie between me and God. Then the horizontal lie between me and my brothers, my sisters. And then this internal lie, what used to be sin isn't anymore and God doesn't judge. Look at verse number 17. Ye have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet ye say, wherein have we wearied Him? And he answers their question ironically. He says, when ye say, everyone that doeth evil, what's the next two words? 
is good. How did we get here? I was on the phone with Ron today. What did I say? The Bible was true 3,000 years ago. Wisdom is laying slain in the streets. Everyone that's evil is good. Read on. Everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord. And He doth delight in them. Oh, God takes pleasure in the evil of this world. Do we even know Him at all? Do we know His Word at all? Do we know why our, our sin-sick heart is in the condition that it is in at all? He delighteth in them. Or, where is the God of judgment? I'm going to need a hand real quick. And Ron, you're the, you're the closest one. Hop up here real quick. Help me, help me. I won't, I won't uh, tie you up, set you on fire, stab you, poke you, anything like that. I just need you to walk a little bit. Can you handle, handle that? All right, good. All right, so I'm going to stand uh, right over here, and you stand uh, with me. Right, uh, one more step, good. All right, that's good right there. And every time I'm going to take a step towards you, I just need you to take a step that way. All right, so I'm just demonstrating. I heard this uh, whew, a long time ago back in college. I want to thank Pastor Mike Davis. If uh, by chance you ever see this, brother, when you taught this to me, I blew my mind away. Well, what he said was this, is that ever since the beginning of the church, the church has been in lockstep with the world. You understand what I mean by that? I'm going to demonstrate it with you. That, that every time, if, 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 I'm, if I'm the church, and, and Ron is the world, and, and Ron is you know, the wickedness, the worst, uh, should I keep going? Uh, Ron is the world. Uh, uh, they're lost and they're dead uh, in, in their sins. And they take a step farther towards wickedness. You know what the church does? And every time the world says, you know what, uh, uh, you know what, you know what, killing babies, killing babies is okay. Some people in the church, they. And, and the more wicked the world gets, the church decides, you know what, I've got to be like them to reach them. And it's now been hundreds of years. And we wonder why our churches are so powerless. Because in the place where the world once made its mainstay, the church now waves its flag. My friend, the truth is that, thank you, Ron. I appreciate it, brother. The truth is that what used to be sin is still sin. God never has ever rewritten His Word to say that sin is not sin. He's never rewritten, rewritten His Word. He's never said, you know what? You can take, you know what? Hey, we're almost to Malachi here. Uh, by the end of Malachi, you know what? You just take that, tear that in half, and we'll just use the first part. It's not, it's a lie. Notice what Peter says in reaction. Because you know what? Even, even four or five, five hundred years later, when Peter writes his epistles uh, to the scattered brothers, this lie was still there. You say, prove it. Okay. <laughs> Peter does. Second Peter chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. This second epistle, beloved, I write unto you, both, in both which to stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance... He says, pure minds, not that their minds were pure, but they, that they had been purified through the washing of the regeneration. They, they had been saved. They at least made a confession of salvation. And he's saying, you've seemed, uh, you've seemed to have forgotten something here. Let me, I'm going to stir the pot for just a moment. That ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing first 
that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of His coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Can you hear it? Can you hear it on the news? Can you hear it? Uh, you know, in the market, but can, I mean, you just hear it. Oh, the Lord's coming back. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Where's the promise of His coming? God doesn't judge. Notice what He says. These two things are incredibly linked together. Same book, same chapter, two verses away. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise. As some men count slackness or as the slackness of men is, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord, what's it say, church? Will, will come. I wish that showed up on there. That'd be amazing, but it doesn't. He will come. He will come. Well, when's he coming? I don't know, but I know that he is. I know that he is. Notice how he comes, and I appreciate you reading it, as a thief in the night. How many of you signed up for that? You signed up for the thief to come break into your house this week, next week. I love those commercials. I mean, I would never get those cameras because they can definitely be hacked and all, but the, the commercials of the, of the guy with the, the, the scully on his face and, you know, a little handlebar mustache and uh, makes uh, robbers look real cool and all. And he says, well, I'm going to get a home security system because I know how robbers work. No, you don't. Not this one. Not this one. He comes when we least expect it. He comes when, when no one's ready. He comes when no one's thinking about it. He comes even when the church is asleep. He comes as a thief in the night. What happens then? It's too late. The heavens pass away. It's a great noise. The elements shall melt with a fervent heat in the earth also. And the works that are therein shall be burned up. This internal lie. He says what once was sin is now okay. God doesn't judge. And when's He coming? My friend, He's coming. Let me ask you tonight. Do these three lies found in Malachi chapter number 2, are any of these creeping in to our daily life? And they don't show up in big ways. Never do. They never do. You know? You know, Gerald's not going to wake up tomorrow and be like, you know what, I don't believe God exists. <laughs> Probably not going to happen. At least I hope not, Gerald. <laughs> That's not how it works. Abram was telling me a story of a good friend of his who began in church and it was just months into years into, I don't believe there's a God. It's a slow faith. And it happens by, by building one lie on top of another. Well, God did it. Well, I wish that I... Whatever whatever it is. I don't have to get specific. But believing lies nullifies our ability to love to the capacity that we've been called to love. That we've been called to believe. It shades it all. And not rose colored. Father, tonight... As we've taken time to look at this really incredible book of the Bible, that even 400 years before you were born was characterizing the church today, I pray, Lord, that as holistically as this describes the church, it would not be describing us individually. Lord, may we not be deceived by the lies from the father of lies that you don't care about the condition of our heart, only, the, only what we do. 
How could we be so legalistic to think that Jesus died on the cross just so I would behave correctly? Oh no. Father, forgive us. Lord, help us if we believe that we can be right with you and wrong with others. It just doesn't work that way. There's a measuring stick that we're falling short at, Lord. And Lord, how dare we ever think that what once was sin is now okay with you, that you're not going to judge us. You're not even going to come. Father, your son is coming. And he is the great and fearful judge of all the earth. Help us, Lord, to walk accordingly. Father, the truth is I believe that many in the sound of my voice tonight, they love you. Well, Lord, our heart's prayer and our heart's desire is that we'd lay this to heart and we'd love you more. And instead of believing a truth, believing a lie, we would strive for the truth. So help us, Lord. We'll be greatly helped tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. I want to um, certainly take some time uh, for some prayer requests tonight. And uh, so if you have something, please don't, don't be uh, ashamed to share. Nothing too small for us to take to the throne of God. Amen. Miss Mary. Yes. Yeah.